Forget about it. All right, chapter 4. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all God's people said? Amen. Father, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the clarity I please uh, that you will give us tonight and that we can understand and live our Catholic faith. And Lord Jesus, stir within us the power of your Spirit to live these words and have a life of true transformation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, and now and shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Chapter 4, verse 1. And as we start again, I want to welcome the people in Colorado, and I want to welcome the people in Louisiana. It's really great visiting you, and I hope we can do it again sometime. And people out in California, we welcome you. Thank you for listening. And people around the world in the Caribbean, we welcome you and people in different countries, in Russia and China, and of course, the Philippines. Yeah. We want to we welcome you. So uh, please, uh, during the time we ask God's blessings upon you, but we also ask, just let us know that you're listening so we can rejoice what God is doing in our midst. So we, we, we just praise and thank God that th these little broadcasts can travel around the world and reach you with the gospel. And I hope tonight's uh, source of study will be a blessing to all of you. Everybody turn in your Bibles to Galatians. Who wrote Galatians? Paul. Where's Gal Galatia? Greece. Turkey. 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 Uh, it's, called, it's called in your Bibles Asia Minor. It was written around the year 49. There's, there's a debate going on. Was 1 Thessalonians the first book Paul wrote? Or was it Galatians? Some say Galatians. Some say First Thessalonians. In all my studies with St. Paul, I've been trained to hear 51 AD was First Thessalonians, but now we believe Galatians was about 48 because there was a problem. Now, how do you get to heaven? By what? Grace. Grace. Okay, can you earn your way to salvation? No. Have you ever tried before? Yes. How many ever tried to earn your way with God? Is that good news for you that you can't earn it? Yes. Because I don't want to find you guys on your deathbed. I hope I get in. <laughs> huh? I hope I make it. Don't do that. I, I want you to be there. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Are you, are you going to be ready for that? I, go, I hope I get in, cross your heart, and hope to die. <laughs> Okay, if you go down with me, chapter 4, verse 19. Now, Paul's talking to the Galatians, and uh, he, he was upset that they'd been bewitched because they had the faith of God, and what did they do? They went back to what? They had faith. Do you all have faith? Yes. Now, how do you say faith in Greek? Pistis. Now, when the Bible says you have faith in God, it's a firm walk. You know, a lot of people are coming to church daily Sunday and they say, oh, I believe in God. That will never cut the mustard. That will never get you to heaven. It's got to be a firm walk. So when you say, I believe, it's like, you, here's the word of God, here's the teachings of the church. I believe. I, you, there's no question in my mind, Jesus is God. There's no question in my mind, Jesus is risen from the dead. That's belief. You understand the difference? And you don't go around. Remember, uh, you've been raised to practice false humility. How many ever practice false humility? I hope I get in. I mean, that, that's pretty scary. If eternity is forever and ever and ever, and you're not coming back for another round, amen? And you hope you get in? How many know that? I, that's called, called false humility. By God's grace, I'm going. Doesn't that sound better? Yes. Don't you want to go like that? Amen? Yes. But you can't be with the hootsie dootsie girls and everything else. You've got to have a converted life. You've got to have faith with what? Legs on it. Okay? Not boots. Faith with legs on it. Amen? So, the Jews were practicing, the Galatians, they were practicing the law, 613 laws, and they thought, that will save me. But it's so quickly to go backwards to the way you knew it. And I'm afraid, um, if I were to leave, you'd go back and say, be good and you'll get to heaven. That's not it. You've got to have a living faith in Jesus. Amen? Amen. So let's, let's go to verse 19. 17. They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out, but they make much of them. There's so much religion out there that's killing you. How many ever heard this one? Go into a church and make three wishes. 
Where did that come from? <laughs> I, I was in Colorado, and they, I was in Colorado last weekend, and uh, uh, this week, and, and one church they put out, say this prayer nine times, click your heels three times, and you get it. <laughs> I mean, that's making up religion. Like, amen? For, uh, for, look at verse 18. For a good purpose, it is always good to be made much of, and not only that I am present with you. Now, underline verse 19 where we start tonight. Here we can see the heart of Paul. And this is the heart of the shepherd. Now, Jesus is called the good shepherd, right? He lays down his what? Life. Jesus is called the great shepherd because he's risen. And Jesus is called the chief shepherd. So when Jesus is called the good shepherd, when Jesus is called the great shepherd, when Jesus is called the chief shepherd, he died, he rose, and he's coming again. So Jesus is called three times the shepherd in the New Testament. So now Paul has to be a shepherd. Now, do you, does everybody here love everybody? Sure. <laughs> now, you got to love that person as much as you love your wife. Have you, have you been there? If you don't love your wife, don't love them like that, okay? <laughs> but love has to grow. Now, Paul says right here, look at verse 19. My little children with whom I'm getting in travail until Christ be formed in you. What does Paul say? I'm pregnant. Oh, wait a minute, you're a man. How can you be pregnant? I want... What's a travail, ladies? Ladies, do you remember? you got to help me out. Any mothers here? What's travail? I'll give you travail. Ah! Any, any mothers have travail? And your husband's there. Push, honey. Push. And, and the men are kind of casual. You're suffering. You're screaming. You're sweating. Push, honey. Push. It'll be over momentarily, honey. Four hours later. Ah! Push, honey. Push. Now, in all the prophets in the Bible, they always speak of travail. Let me show you how many know Jesus did it. Flip back, go to John chapter 16. Some people say I go to fast, I gotta slow myself down. So, and Simon is saying, slow. John 16. Who wrote, who wrote John? John? You're getting smarter as you go. <laughs> Everybody go to verse 21. John 16, verse 21. Now remember, if you are, if you, are you all prophets in here? Yes. 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 How many have interesting kids that drive you nuts? Yes. You have one? Just only one person we got to pray. You, you have, does, do your kids drive you nuts? Yes, they do? Now you wanted them. They're yours. And you wouldn't you would not have life without them. That's correct. So you people are in travail. Right? And you know what travail is? Oh how many have husbands that drive you in travail? How many have wives that drive you in travail? Oh okay, amen? So do you know what travail is? Right? Travail is, you want that person to be better than they are. You want all your kids to be better? Yes. And how many have interesting kids that are not following the right... You don't have to, you don't have to confess. This is, this is uh, not to tell, so I can find out what's happening with your kids. Because you'll come and talk to me about them and forget about it. So, <laughs> do you see travail? Travail is a prophetic word that says, you're not where you should be. So, if... If Paul says, by faith you're saved, and all of a sudden you're going backwards, what do I got to do? Do you know it's interesting, in, in today's liturgy, Numbers 11 was mentioned, and they're saying, is this what we get? We want to go back to Egypt. You know why? They wanted the flavors on their tongue. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? So they wanted to be like the Italians and eat garlic for the rest of their life, you know? <laughs> And, and leaks and everything else. So, what's a travailing? Now, the, the Pentecostals around here, uh, you know what, well, I, I, I had, one day some, some Pentecostal group said, can we use your building? I said, okay. This is in Newark, so you know how they are in Newark. 
And so what is the name of your group? They were called the Wailing Women. Oh, yeah. Wailing Women. <laughs> you know, Catholics have the Rosary Altar Society. They had the Wailing Women. So I said, come on in. And I, and I gave them the room downstairs. And they go, Alon! <laughs> Can you see Catholic women doing that? They say, all right, honey, we're going to say a prayer. And everybody eat your coffee and your buns. That's Catholic experience. Isn't it? <laughs> but when the Pentecost, oh, yeah! And the Catholic women are like, there's extra cake here. I, I really have never really seen Catholics travail. When you have kids, when you had your kids, did you travail? Yes. Have you stopped travailing? No. Now here's what I want you to do. Get into there's a, there's a movie coming out. You all gotta see it. All right. So have a date night with your your boyfriend over there. And it's called the War Room. And I've just joined. Uh, I'm part of a coalition called Faith and Coalition. I was just down preaching in Delaware, and uh, to give kind of. And what we're doing now is we are upset with what's going on in this country. So we are fighting mad, and we're gonna fight with the gospel in love. And there's a movie coming out at the end of this month. Please go see it. War Room. I don't know if it'll be in selected theaters, but we've got, this theater around here is usually good, so I can pop in and see it. And it's about a, it's about a mama. She has a room, and there's divorce going on in her family. Some of you might know that story. And she literally has a closet she goes in. And what this is teaching us is we've got to get really praying. We've got to get into travailing before the Lord. And it's not a concept. So when you talk to Pentecostals, sometimes they say, we're just travailing in the Lord. <laughs> and the Catholics are worrying about, you know, see you next month, all right, who's bringing the cake? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> all right, underline verse 21, uh, John 16, 21. Now, this, Paul travailed for his community. Can I tell you something? I travail for you. Do you know what my favorite words are when I look at some of you? Oh. So, you know what you're going to say if you hear me doing that? Father Bill's giving birth again. Oh. Oh. Right, ladies? Ladies, when you have your babies, did you do that at all? What was your favorite sound? Grunting. <laughs> uh, any pregnant women here? Okay. Uh, so, did you grunt at all? When your babies were coming? Were you in pain a lot? Did you sing in high C? Yes. Did you sing some enchanted? No, you didn't sing like that, right? <laughs> Underline verse, verse 21. When a woman is in travail, Jesus said, she has sorrow. Why do you ladies have sorrow when you're in travail? It hurts. <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> well, were, you ladies in, were you ladies sad when, when your babies were coming? Yeah. What happens to some women who uh, have, have their babies? Depression. What happens? Did, did you? Did anybody? Did anybody was sorrowful when you had your babies? No. 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 You weren't sorrowful. You didn't have a little post. Uh, Artem. No. You didn't have any of that. That's the travailing. You see, what Paul says is, I've announced to you the gospel. You know, when I when I have really travailed, when I led a man to Christ, I led a man to the Word of God. And, and all of a sudden I found out, remember years ago that, that, that old dude on television, uh, Armstrongism, do you remember that? And you go to re restaurants and you have stacks of magazines. And he joined that and I said, how can that? You know, I went, ah! Or if somebody would leave here and become a Jehovah to knock your lights out. <laughs> Amen? Amen? This is the truth. Jesus is God. And when you join the Jehovah, you deny that Jesus is God. I'm going to knock your lights out. Everything I do is Christian love. Amen? Believe that Jesus is the son of man. Yeah, they're, they're terrible. Okay, underline verse 21. When, when a woman is in travail, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she's delivered the child, she no longer remembers the anguish or joy that a child is what? Born into the world. So when your baby comes out, you don't say, Hey, look, kid, do you know what you know, the pain you cause? Well, we tell them when they're in their 20s. Yeah. <laughs> Amen? So then he says there, so you, underline verse 22. So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice. And no one will take your joy from you. Now joy, if you underline the word joy, joy means you walk in the power and the presence of Jesus Christ. Are you all, Now, to be a believer in Jesus on a good day, are you all believers in Jesus? Listen to me. You have to have joy every single day. 
Now, joy does not, I, I'll cheer you up, so hopefully. Joy does not mean you've got to smile every day. So we can meet each other and say, how you doing? I'm miserable. But what does joy mean? But I know I walk in the presence of God. Okay, you don't have to smile. That's not a requirement. Amen. Because you, you know what scares people? Hi! <laughs> and you know what one person said to me? I said, hi! They said, you probably are. No, no, no. <laughs> one man met another man and says, hey, hey. Can you tell me what are, what are the two problems of life? He says, I don't know, and I don't care. You're absolutely right. Those are the two problems. Right? So, do you like those people? Hi. I had a seminary. You know what he would say every morning? Good morning. I said, no. Next he says, there, Lord Jesus, on that day you will ask nothing of me. Now, so when you're really poor, so what, what's Paul saying from the mouth of Jesus? I'm in travail because you guys don't get it, but you've got to return to faith and living in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why we're now setting up for these births that they're, they're going to mention. Paul's going to give us what is called an allegory of births. Now, in the original sense, if we went back to study them, that's not what it means, but Paul's calling an allegory, okay? So he's taking what is a familiar and says, let me tell you about the new birth. Now, everyone here should be born again by now, right? That means you, you, were, you were born once out of your mother and that was screaming. But how many know when you were born again, it was more screaming? When Jesus made us, how many know Colossians 1, verse 15 to 23 says God made you through Jesus? Now you always thought growing up, and uh, it's not that it was, it's correct, but let's fill it into pieces a little more. God the Father made you, we call God the creator of the world. But how many know Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 23 says Jesus created you? Did you know that? Colossians. Chapter 1, verse 15 to 23. Jesus created you. Isn't that, isn't that a game changer? Now, when God made you, he said, let there be. Boom. But when Jesus redeemed you, he, he says, I did not spare my only son. Some, Romans chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. So when Jesus redeems us, brothers and sisters, guess what's happening? The pain is really great, isn't it? It was the anguish of the cross. What, is, what does Jesus mean there by hour? It means the cross. The hour. And it's the cross. All right, back to me to Galatians. Are you getting this? Now, let's, let's see what Paul says about getting born into the kingdom. Go back with me to chapter 4 of Galatians. My little children. Now, underline that, little children. So, what's the image? And you were mentioning where, where in the Bible is father, right? Remember? Here he, what, if Paul calls you little children, what is he then? How do you interpret that right away? You're my children. And you see, one thing, I, one thing I want to do is I don't want to lose any of you to the kingdom of God. So i got to make sure, the reason why I preach more than five minutes on Saturday night, you know why? Because I want my children to get the word of God. Can I do it in five minutes? Absolutely. Usually here, upstairs here, I, I get you out in a half hour. Do I want to get you out in a half hour? No, I want to get you out in three hours, but you, 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 and you don't even take me to lunch after. So, so anyway, you know, I still want to, I, I, I still want, because you're my children. So here's 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. Paul says, I am a father who begets you in Christ. Okay? 1 Corinthians 4, 15. So what is he saying? My little children. The word, the word is technia. My, my children. I am in travail. So now when you're going through a spiritual birth, and here's why some people in your family don't like you. Because you want to be spiritually born again. Do they want to be spiritually born again? No. What will they say? I want my mother back. Yeah. They, want, they want you to go back to being the wicked witch of the West. They don't want you converted. Because if you decide to be converted to Jesus tonight, you're going to upset the equilibrium in your family. You are. You are. Oh, by the way, I don't curse anymore. Oh, uh, but we do. Turn that TV off. We like it. Um, and it goes on, how many of you upset the equilibrium? That's why they're upset. Because they want their lifestyle the way they interpret it. And they're not here studying the word of God with you. So next line there. Whom I am in travail until Christ be formed in you. So what's Paul saying? I want Jesus in you. Now I'm going to baptize little Billy soon. And you know what? I'm going to, I'm going, I've got to go speak to his parents. And guess what? I feel pregnant. I feel pregnant. <laughs> and I feel pregnant. What's my pregnancy? I want you to be formed in Christ. 
And so when they hold their son for the first time and they look at him in all his features, how many know when you held your baby, what did you do to your babies? Didn't you study them? Yeah. Didn't you look at their hands? Yeah. And did, what did they do the first days? Oh, he looks like the mother. No, he looks like the father. No, he looks yeah. like the grandfather. <laughs> right? How many know we go back and forth who he looks like? Who cares? The kid doesn't care. He's, like, he's glad to be alive. Amen? And then you go, you go all along. Oh, no, I can tell you. You can see the features. He's got the notes. He's got the chin. He's got everything else. <laughs> But my formation that I want to see in you, that's why you've got to study the Bible. You've got to have catechism. And most churches around here, and in all my travels, they don't have any study for adults. And if there is, it's a little blue moon, and you, you, I, I thank God for each of it. Did I say I thank God for you? Yes. So you've got to be formed. Yeah. And what is that for formation? Your formation, if you circle the word there, I've got to be formed. What is that? A metamorphosis. How many know you need a metamorphosis? That means as you are, you can't stay like this. Turn to the person next to you and say, you need to change. <laughs> Some of you are shaking your head. Some of you say, me? <laughs> so, circle the word form. You've got to be formed in Christ. Now, to be formed in Christ, the Greek word is metamorphosis. Okay? Now, every one of us has to do. You have not been taught loud enough and clear enough. I don't care how old you are. Some of you are in your 80s. Some of you are, are 120 today. But listen to me. You still need to be formed. Because where does that go back? If you look in the book of Romans again, because remember, this is, this is a kissing cousin to Romans. Go, go back with me to Romans. Make a left. Who wrote Romans? Okay, so how many, how many now will accept the, the new title? By the way, remember years ago we used to call it CCD. Over here, they don't call it CCD, even though some people refer to it as that. It's called faith formation. So you got to be formed. So today, I, we have all these 800 kids and so, so forth, and I, my job is to form them. So I got to make sure they get formed in these two weeks. Uh, so I got to form them. I got to form them. That's right. I get two weeks. They're in, they're in boot camp. Now, everybody go with me to Romans 8. If you go down to verse 29. Now let me tell you about the formation. Here, here's your birthing in the Lord. Amen? Here's what the new birth is all about. And then we're going to, then we're going to go back and Paul's going to take known figures, but he's going to make a story with them. It's not the interpretation of what that means, but he's going to use what they know, and he's going to take what they know and say, what if they were formed this way? And it's going to be talking about birth. Till I be formed in you. This, this is such a great passage. Now everybody go with me to Romans 8. Everybody in Romans? Yeah. Now go down to verse 29. For those he foreknew, he, he also predestined. Now does everybody know you were saved in an eternity past? You know, I, I was walking through Colorado and we went to uh, Dinosaur Ridge. What I got to go through for the kingdom of God? And they have these paw prints of dinosaurs. Which was it? Dinosaur Ridge. And then, then alongside they have, on the rocks, they have part of a bone of, of somebody. Okay? I touched it. And, and the man said it was 1.7 billion years. I went, whoa, that's a long time. <laughs> Do I believe that science? No. I don't believe that science. I just let him talk. All right? Uh, and, and we paid. The, we got to pay our way on these little things. So what, these, these, those guys are dead, aren't they? But my, my problem is, I want you to be formed. So this is how you get formed. Ready? Look at how many of you are all predestined. So when were you saved? Everybody in this room, you were saved before the foundation of the earth. Is that a mind blowing statement? Mm -hmm. Before this globe was was even set forth by God. Now in an eternity past. Does everybody know God lived in an eternity past? As long as God lived, what was that? Forever. Do you know God lived forever back that way? Do you know God will live forever this way? Forever, all the way God, all the way back that way, which was forever. He knew you would be saved. How many, how many think you love him a little bit more? And when he made you, he said, I'll never do that again. So, from the, before the foundation, Paul says in Ephesians, he knew you were going to be saying, now... Because you and I sin, did anybody here ever sin before? You and I, this is just an, an allegory. You and I became a triangle. Just, just amusement, okay? I'm trying to get my point across. 
But this is the way we were, we were in sin, we were trying to go. But God says, okay, Bill, I want to save you. I'm going to make you a square. Yeah, you are square. I was just going to say that. <laughs> Usher, remove that one. So now, what does he have to do? Because this is the way I arrived. He has to put this shape into this shape. But guess what? I'm in no shape. So what does he have to do to my triangle? How many know I have to be changed? And what's the difficulty of your family being redeemed? The same thing. I hope you follow my example. There's still triangles. And you're a square. You're, you're being formed in Christ. And guess what? They don't want to come with you. And because this is going to do what? This going down here to down here is called what? Travail. Do you see that? If you take away some of your parts, you go, ah. Oh. Now, do you love Jesus? You're going to all tell me yes. Remember, if you love Jesus... The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want anything. And so what happens to your desires when you're following Christ? They absolutely change. Come on, let's go to party. Now, if you anybody dip into a party, watch the guys. They always hold a beer like this. <laughs> they want a brewski? <laughs> Yeah, and, and they're drinking and then they're eating burping and the guys shift over here they don't talk to the women and the women go by the table and they go oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and usually when you have celebrations in your family the guys are over here with their brewskis yes. and now and then someone said I'm going outside for a cigar <laughs> And the wives are going, and the wives are over here. <laughs> but now, the triangle has to go into the square. Am I making my point? No. <laughs> now, how many know to get that into there, how many know they don't fit? Right? Amen? Amen. So what does God have to do? Holy Spirit, come, Holy Spirit. He's got to push you, change you, shape you, right? And guess what? It hurts! Because guess what you have to do if you want to follow Jesus, the real Jesus who died for you? You have to change your attitude. You have to change your ways. You have to do things you don't want to do. Is that a killer? It's called conversion. Now, how many of us are getting converted to Christ in your average church? Few. We say, all right, I accepted Jesus, my personal Lord and Savior. I'm in. I hope so. Henry, I hope you're in. Are you in, Henry? All right. But now to take the triangle and put it now. That's what that means. Is this making sense to you? Yes. Go with me at chapter 8, verse 29. This is good. I should have preached this before. But those who for, he foreknew, he also predestined, underline that, to be conformed. There's a metamorphosis again. To the image of his son. So really, what's the rest of your life? Conforming. To whom? Jesus. So what did Jesus do? You got to do. How many are doing with Jesus? How many fall short a little bit? How many fall short? A lot. So guess what? Your triangle is still trying to get into the box. But when, you, when your triangle goes into the box, guess what? You should look like a box. Not a triangle anymore. And so you're being reshaped. Jeremiah chapter 18, we get the image of being reshaped with the potter. And what, what does he do? When, when God puts his hands on you, remember you know that story with the potter and it spins and spins and spins and, and he's using it. And if it doesn't come out to the right shape, what has he got to do? He's got to throw it down a crack. Now, how many know when a sheep goes astray? Are you, how many ever went astray in your life? Remember when you were 17? Weren't you wild people? You were wild. What were you? We were you wild. And now you just now, after 50, just now, you're starting to calm down. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. But when you go on those Caribbean cruises, hot, 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 hot right? This, this is the side say, thank God Father Bill doesn't say me. Hot, 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 hot. And then when you come in, the midnight buffet starts hot, 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 hot. And then they have, in the Caribbean sun, out, well, it's nighttime, and the big ice is going, and you're going, hot, hot, hot. Thank God Father Bill's not here. Hot, 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 hot. And then when you come back to Bible Saint Money, hello. 
I know you. <laughs> you know, when you tell me, you're, just tell me your destination of where you're going on vacation. I have ideas. Okay, now. So in order, now under, underline the next line. Do you understand what Paul's saying? In order that, now this is, this is so good, that the firstborn for, uh, among the many. Now, what's going to happen to you? Does everybody know when you go to heaven? You're going to be the firstborn. What, what is, circle the word firstborn, what does it mean? I get the inheritance. Right? How many have ever felt you were cheated because you had other siblings ahead of you? Now, I'm the baby in my family. I felt cheated. You know why? Because my parents took more pictures of my first brother than me. <laughs> How many know when you have your third child, the pictures dropped? <laughs> and we didn't have selfies and everything else. The picture. <laughs> but when you only have one, picture, we Right? Uh, amen? How many know I saw more of my brother's pictures on the wall than mine? <laughs> Amen? I said, what did, what did you do? Drop me on my head, Mom? What happened to you? <laughs> so here's the travail. The travail is getting me from here into here. Do you understand my, the image that, that I've chosen tonight? Then he says that the firstborn, and those who he predestined, are you predestined? Yes. And God calls you. Pat. 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 Paul. Paul. You're called. But you've got to realize, if you're going from here to there, you've been called to be a box instead of a triangle. Right? Amen? Yeah. Are you getting this? Yes. This is, you're getting good stuff, Sister Hashemayim. Uh, Father, predestined, we talked about this before, there are certain churches that are teaching that people are predestined to be saved, meaning that some were to be saved, but some are not. Only those who are predestined that's not what this word means. Well, can I help you with a thought? Yeah. You're right. No, you know, I agree. Um, Jesus does not send anybody to hell. It's God's desire that nobody goes there. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, 4, 5. Um, but what, what this does mean is God knows what, what your decision is going to be. Right? Wow. Everybody has the right to make that decision. Everybody has the right to make it. Right. Right. Then he says, you're called, next he says, you're justified, that's by faith, and those whom he justifies, he glorifies. Now, glorified means you're going to get brand new bodies. How many, how many need one right about now? All right, forward with me to Galatians. Are, are you getting this? Yes. Now we come into, um, he says there, travail until Christ be formed in you. Uh, do you understand what he means by being formed in you? Yes. We spent a lot of time on that, but it's really a jewel of a verse, isn't it? To, to, to see. Now, now you can understand... When you want your kids to grow up spiritually, and when they're 19, I am 19, going on 35, I still live with my father and my mother. <laughs> and guess what? They're not formed. The Holy Spirit told me, I, I left my house at the age of 18. And as I left my house at the age of 18, I never slept in my bed in my house. I'm out. I got a, I'm, I'm a person on mission. Amen? And uh, I know Jesus saved the entire world, those who come to him, but I got to get as many souls as I can for the Lord. And that passion has never left me. Amen? Amen. So back with me now. Um, uh, verse 20. I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, but I'm perplexed about you. How can I go backwards? So this is to, to prevailing. What do you want your kids to do? Be men and women of God, don't you? You all want your kids to be men and women of God? Yes. And you know what I want when I look at that congregation every Sunday? Here's what I want. Here's what's going on inside me. Come on, God. I want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Now, you know what you think when I say that to you? You think you want to be like, I don't want you to be like me. I want you to be like Him. And you're sitting there thinking, I already am like Him. I'm a good person. I, oh, back to square one, okay? <laughs> back, here I go again. Back to square one. So, so guess, guess, what I'm, guess what I'm doing? I'm looking at you. I'm praying for you. I'm like, oh... So, what's my most difficult day here? Sunday. Sunday. Because I'm, I'm putting up Sunday the sign, Judas left early too. So, I, I'm just doing that. Yes? You should. <laughs> yes? Uh, Father, I was listening to Father Rochelle last week from Tony Galatians on his commentary. He was basically saying that it all starts with Baptist. It does. As we progress. Yes, it, right. The second, second, seven, 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 right. 
Right. And born again has more to do with baptism rather than a confession of faith. Is that right? Baptism is confession of faith. But an infant doesn't have that yet. No, when Paul, calls, Paul calls his little kids here technia because they're losing their faith and going back to the way they were. Do they have a true faith? So if, if it's baptism, you've got to have four people encouraging you. Is that a reality today? No. It should be. It should be, but is it? It's not a reality. Anybody ever get your kids baptized? Guess what you didn't do? You picked godparents, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Did you have those two godparents raise them up in the faith along with you? No. no. What, did they even send you a check year after that? Forget it. Do they, do you, what did you do? You celebrated their birthday, but you didn't celebrate their baptism day. Never. In fact, if you, got, if you remember when they were baptized, you, you have no idea. Well, the other point that he was making is that born again it really means uh, water and spirit. Yes. Right, that's not true. That is not true. That is not true. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. There is profession. I don't know if you heard me. When you're baptized, you have to have a profession of faith. Must. There must be a faith content. Absolutely. So you got to understand what. I, I didn't hear the program or what he said in the context. And hopefully he's home with God. He was talking about John 3, 4, 5. Yes, well, it, there, has to be, there has to be a faith content. You cannot be baptized without a faith content. In fact, in Mark chapter 16, Jesus says, He who believes and is baptized. Notice that faith comes first. There must be a faith content. And so that, that's what I'm trying to do. That's my, oh, every, every Sunday. Do you know I do that every Sunday? I got a smile at you. Oh, oh, oh. Right, amen? All right, now, here comes the allegory. Now, the allegory is between two women. Who's woman number one? Hagar. Now, Hagar, go into the chapel and we're going. Now, here's Abram. Remember, how, how many years did he live? 175. He got married twice. Remember, I told you that. So we have Abraham. There you are, standing there lovingly. Whether or not you should. Now, remember, see these H's? Now, remember Sarah's original name. You're the only ones on your block that know this. Sarah's original name was Sarai. Genesis eleven twenty nine. Uh, her original name was Ishka. I'm giving you Orthodox Judaism background. From the notes to the first century. Not many Christians know this. Her name was Ishka. So... Remember, guys, when you were first married to those incredible brides that you have? You forgot already. Did you ever call them little names? I mean, good names. Um, well, let's, let's do the good names. <coughs> Did you call them Cupcake Bunny, Honey, Dunny, whatever, you know? Amen? When I go to my house, my brother says to my sister-in-law, Hi, doll! <coughs> doll. <laughs> doll. I just see this thing walking like this. <laughs> How many know words have images, right? <laughs> Ladies, what did your husband call you? All right, now as we move along. So Abraham, now see these H's? Now remember, what's God's name? Y-H-W-H. You got to hear tomorrow night's broadcast on Wednesday because I'm, I'm doing something with Psalm 23 I've never seen before. It's all about God's. It's utterly outstanding. So Abraham married Sarah. What did God do? Change the name. He gave each of them an H. You see that? That's why God changed their name. Now, so Abraham, you're going to have a kid. When was he told? 75. How many know that can shock your system at 75 when you find out a baby's coming? Right? <laughs> Amen? Henry, would you like another baby right about now? <laughs> Henry said no. Would you like a baby right about now? All right, they both say no. They're on the same page. Okay, now. So say, Henry, you didn't get your, 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 your firstborn until you were 99. <laughs> Sarah was 89 and she found out she was pregnant. Oh, no. Amen? So she went into a fit of laughter. Now, at 75, he saw the baby's coming. 24 years. But he wanted to help God along. So Sarah had a lady called Hagar. 
And he said, Honey, the baby's coming. Take her because nothing's happening with me. And who's born 13 years before is, it, is Ishmael. And then when he becomes 100 years old, then Isaac is born, Yitzhak. Laughter. Guess what happens? How many know, have you ever seen two women, three women, four women in a kitchen? Very dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> Extreme danger, danger, danger. Now, Sarah is going to die, and guess what he does? If you look at Genesis 25, her name is changed to Keturah. He marries her. And guess what happens? They produce four more kids. <laughs> Okay, now, you, you got that? Abraham married after Sarah died. Look at Genesis 25. I thought it was only No, Sarah died. Hint, hint, hint. He was only married one man to one woman. Is that amazing or what? Okay, one man and one woman. Man marries woman. <laughs> Amen. Are you getting this? Okay, so... Sarah wanted to help him, and so here, take Hagar, produce bad news. Because now, this is the birthing of the Jewish-Arab conflict right now. Okay? And it goes that when Ishmael was born, if you read in Genesis, it says he was a wild ass of a man. How many, do you get that? You get that? And they can't, they will never admit to you on television that they're half-brothers. They're called Semites. They're Semitic. We are not Semitic people. We're the European type or the, or the Asian type. So we, we came from, uh, we came from, who do we come from? Japheth. Remember the Noah's sons? If you're African American, who did you come from? Ham. If you're European Asian, you came from Japheth. So if we go all the way, if we go all the way back into the family tree, we'll be doing that on the 22nd, won't we? So you, we got to ask God to forgive us from our Japheth line. Okay, you're the only ones on your block that know this stuff, amen? So this causes the conflict. Back with me now, just to give you a little background. Let's see now the allegory. So this is, this is Paul using this story, but he's going to use it to his advantage to make a point. I just, I just use triangles and a box to make a point. All right. Now, I'm not saying that's what Paul was saying, triangles and boxes. But I was giving you an allegory, okay? And I think you got the allegory. Let's go into the allegory. Hashemayim. So Sarah lost hope. Yeah. But she, 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 they, they were trying to figure out God. How many ever try to figure out God? <laughs> See, everybody in this room, we all try to help God along. Look, God. If I win the lottery, I will give 10% to St. Mary's. <laughs> you know that story? The guy's in the middle of the lake. And he says, and he, the water, the boat is lost. God, i got to swim to shore. And then all of a sudden, he says, God, if I make it to shore, I will give you $50,000. He gets halfway there. God, help me. If I get to shore, I'll give you $25,000. <laughs> then as he's, then God help me. He's a third, two thirds of, God, I'll give you $10,000. Isn't, isn't that interesting, amen? So, so we, we could see, see here, this is, let, let's look at the problem here. This is called, look at verse 21. This, this is about, do you want to go backwards? He says there, verse 21, uh, tell me, you desire to be under the law, do you hear the law? Now, what does the law say? You've got to obey it, right? How many laws do you got to obey? 613. How many would like to do that? Now, sadly, you were raised on good law. But guess what you all thought? That's how you get to heaven. So when I did door-to-door -door evangelism, which I should, really should get back to doing, um, and scare the people in Middletown, amen? Yeah, you should. <laughs> all right, invite me over. We're coming, okay? i got to go all in your houses anyway, see what I can grow up for food. So, you know, just to, just, to see, just to see brothers and sisters, don't go backwards. This is what the law demands. Look at verse 22. 
For it's written that Abraham had two sons. Father Abraham. Now, who, who are his sons? Ishmael and Isaac. I, I, I like the Hebrew. Yitzhak. Everybody say Yitzhak. And the word Yitzhak means laughter. Now, this is, this is not the original content. If we go study this in Genesis, it's an allegory. It's Paul saying, imagine now this familiar image with us. Okay, everybody, everybody with me on the same page. Now, uh, but one of the slaves was born according to the flesh. What was the flesh? Now, where's your main battle for the rest of your life? The flesh. The flesh. How do you say flesh in Greek? Sarx. Everybody say sarx. Sarx. S-A-R-X. You've got to decide to be a man or woman of flesh, or you've got to decide to be a man or woman of the pneuma, spirit. the spirit. Now, you and I, I, I told you after you're 35, it's very difficult for you to be converted some more. Right? And please God that all of us are on that way. So now, what did Sarah say? Take Hagar. What was that? Flesh. Right? Let's, ready? Want to see if you're in the flesh? You try to help God. I believe in God. You see, a lot of people upstairs, they try to help God. I'm good. All right, we just have a, a terrible uh, earthquake. Uh, let's, let's reach in. Okay, extra. Okay, there. You try to help God. And you feel, you feel good about it, and well, you should. But why don't we become people in the spirit? Right? So everybody understand so far so good? So take, take her. Okay? He goes on to say there, one born uh, according to the flesh, the son of the free woman through promise. Because what was the promise that Abraham's going to get? You're getting a kid. I'm getting old. I'm getting old. Where's the kid? Sarah says, here. I know he's coming. What did God do? Remember, you're in the flesh if you try to help God. Right? You get in trouble. Don't try to help God. The purpose of your walk in God is to allow God to flow through you. Not you trying to help Him. Right? How many ever felt good trying to help God? You know in my life what I tried? To give God a lot of suggestions. <laughs> How many have ever tried to figure out the rest of your life? Did you ever lose your job and say, what am I going to do now? Did you ever have a bad case of... of uh, Family problems, and you say, "What am I going to? What am I? What am I? What, what, what am I? What are you trying to do? I'm trying to help God." And so I say, "Okay, God, this is what I learned. This is how I'm going to walk with you." How many know it's very difficult to get like that? To really be a man or a woman in the spirit, right? Are, are you with me? Okay, now, so everybody following with me so far? What's the promise? Underline the word "promise" there. The promise is what you're going to have a what? A child. Go with me to verse 24. Now, this is an allegory, Paul says. This, in other words, this is not, if we were to study this, this is not what it means. And remember Paul's favorite book in the, in the Bible was called what? Isaiah. What's his second favorite book? His second favorite book is Genesis. So he's using, he's using Genesis examples. Next he says, one of them, he takes now, he takes, he takes them, one is from Mount Sinai, Hagar is from Mount Sinai in Arabia. What does Mount Sinai represent? The old covenant. The old way of doing things. How many know right now, some of you are be bemoaning the fact you wish religion was when you grew up? There's a lot of great things, right? You want the nuns back and the priests back. I just got a shock when I was in Colorado. A, a, a couple came up to me, a beautiful couple. They're getting married in three months. I'm very happy for them. And they said... Our priest just said to me, he's not available the day we're going to get married. We just set up the hall. We just, and so they said to me, they thought I lived in Colorado. I think they were saying, could you do our marriage? Well, you pay my first class flight, honey. We'll talk about it. No. I said, so they want me to pray that their priest was going to be out of town. They don't have a priest yet to marry them. I mean, this is not good. Amen. So the first, th the first thing there is Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Now, look at, look at the two things then. Mount Sinai. All right, what's Mount Sinai, everybody? Where is Mount Sinai located? Arabia. So far, are you following, Brother Henry? Okay. 
it's right by Egypt. And it's right by Arabia. So look what Paul's doing. Here's Israel that goes along this way. Mount Sinai is all the way down here. This is Mount Sinai. And he, he says now, Hagar is the law. Isn't it interesting when you use that? Is that originally what it means? Absolutely not. He says this is an allegory. So, uh, so follow me, Paul says, this is Hagar. So what's Hagar? The 613 what? Lost. Do you want to go back to being with a slave woman? So if you go back to the law, you're going back to slavery. Hagar was a slave. Now, we had a lot of great things happening in our past. We had holy nuns, we had holy priests, and they're all gone now, and here's our faith, and you and I could sit and wish upon a star. We could wish to go backwards. And it's turned some of us off that we wish we'd go back. We can't go back right now. There's a lot of things I want to go back to, but i got to move on. So, I don't want to move back to that which is not the faith. I want to live the faith. I will always bring the best I can, the treasures of the faith, to modern context. But stick with the treasures. I'm not going to deny the Ten Commandments and everything else. So far so good? Then he says to us there, Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Now notice he says there, Arabia. Why Arabia? I, if you look at the Greek, so, some tests say that it is a mountain in Arabia because right next door is what? Saudi Arabia. Now, what is also important about Arabia, what did Paul do when he got first converted? You see, if you've been watching the AD series, they're trying to get it back to NBC for the fall, by the way. So we see what happens. The last scene was they took Peter away to be arrested. So I, I, I've been enjoying the series with you. So w what happened? It didn't happen that Paul, Paul was, it didn't happen that quick. Paul spent 14 years away in Arabia. So here's Arabia right over here. Here's the, the peninsula. And what is Paul doing here? This is where Arabia is. So this is a mountain in Arabia. So he goes on to say there, For she is born with slavery with her children. Uh, now, she corresponds to the present Yerushalayim. Okay, boy, is that an indictment. When you look at Jerusalem, remember, don't be impressed with religion. It's all about a relationship with Jesus Christ. I ask your forgiveness. Because you've been raised in religion instead of a, a powerful relationship with Jesus. Right? Mm -hmm. How many know if you mothers knew that a little bit better with your kids, you would have done something? Mm -hmm. What did you think with your kids? Get them baptized, get them the first communion, and guess what? You, where are your kids today? Don't have them. You lost them, right? But you're getting them back, aren't you? So, what did Paul say? Boy, this is really scary. He says, this now, Mount Sinai, this is Jerusalem. What does Paul say? Jerusalem has been, become a center of people who are religious but don't really live it. That's religion. Paul says to Timothy, many practice the form of religion but do what? Deny, Deny the power. This is Yahushalayim. Now you see another thing. What has to be destroyed? What's well, the second most important date which is going on right now? Does everybody know what's going on right now? Right now, the Jews are fasting and praying because right now, right this week and next week, is the time when the, when the temple fell. It's called Tish Ba'av. And during that time, the men do not shave. So extra beards come out. So if I were your rabbi, I'd be... For how long now? Nine to, it, it's, a, it's a good week or so. Wow. And they have Tish Ba'av. And what do the Jews have to do during the month of August? They repent. And usually, you know what happens by September? 
usually unusual things happen by September. When you spend a whole month repenting, and some of them are very sincere. Now, what's happening in Jerusalem right now? It's a hot spot, isn't it? Hot, hot, hot. Like your Caribbean cruises. But it's, a, it's one of religion. So here now, Paul says, Hagar represents the Jews of today. It's slavery. What's the slavery? Obey 613 laws. Obey 613. Now, what were you taught? You were taught good things by the Holy Spirit. Obey the commandments. And what did you all learn growing up? You learned memorizing things, didn't you? Which was very, very good, right? Very, very good. But guess what happened? Did they emphasize with you a living relationship with Jesus? I'm so sad that didn't happen. That's how we were raised. And we had great nuns, we had a great background, but you need a living relationship with Jesus. Are you following me? Are you getting this? Next he says there, but Jerusalem above is free. Now, look at the word Jerusalem. Remember I told you, in the word Jerusalem. How do you say that in Hebrew? Yerushalayim. Now when you look at the word Yerushalayim, the word ayim means, how, how do you say Jerusalem correctly? Jerusalem's. There are two. So when you hear the word for the rest of your life, Jerusalem, it means there's two of them. There's one here, and there's one up here. Now, what's supposed to happen is this. In Exodus 25, 40, Moses looked up one day, and he saw the exact representation of, of the pattern of the Ark of the Covenant and the tent city. So when you are in Jerusalem, what are you supposed to do when you go to Jerusalem? You're supposed to look up because it's called in the Bible the navel of the earth. So when God created the earth, the Jews believe it's at that spot that the earth formed, right at Jerusalem. And so when you look up, guess what happens? You see the new Jerusalem. John in, in, in the book of Revelation 11:19 sees the Ark of the Covenant coming out of the clouds. Does he get spooked? You better believe it. 11:19. Revelation 11:19 is the epi epicenter of the book of Revelation. So now we have this Jerusalem has become a what? A very bad odor of religion. It's mechanical religion with all the rules and regulations. Now, what did you do growing up? Religion, listen, it has become to us a burden. True faith in Jesus is never a burden. It's a delight. I'm free. That's what we're going to get to chapter 5, verse 1. Born free. How many want to really be free? When I see some of our people practicing... You know, I really, I'm the old-fashioned Catholic. And so when I go to church, <laughs> don't anybody touch me, I'll sue you. <laughs> I had this very pious woman in Jersey City. Anybody ever hear of Jersey City? It's a different country around the world. And when she, when she would, uh, she would, she was very visible. People saying, peace be with you, peace, and she... Immediately, she knelt down, put her head down, and wouldn't touch anybody. That's religion. You could be conservative. You could have all your good devotions, but shake a person's hand. Wow. Wow, no. <laughs> and that's why you understand when you keep telling me years ago, I haven't heard it said here, you know what? I'm religious. <laughs> <laughs> So when you say that to me, fold your hands. Look, look me. <laughs> be reverent, but don't be mean. Amen? Amen? And if somebody does little things a little different, be reverent, love, don't be mean. Amen? Amen. So you're getting this? Then he says there, but Jerusalem above, remember what does Jerusalem mean too? She is our mother. Isn't it interesting that Paul calls Jerusalem above our mother? What do we have an expression now? How many ever heard this at Mother Church? How many ever heard that expression? Next he says there, For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one that does not bear. Bring forth and shout those who are not in travail. And so what happens is, do you see the travail again? These are the people already, what? Formed. 
What passage in the Bible is that? For the desolate hath more children, for she hath a husband. Who's her husband? We're redeemed by God, God aren't we? That's from what, Isaiah? Now remember, redeemed people do what? Sing. So what should you be doing? Rejoice. Remember when Elizabeth was collecting Social Security checks? And there's an encounter we call it the visitation in Luke chapter 1, verse 39 or 45. What did John do when he was in the womb? Now, do you remember, ladies, when your baby was moving inside you? Did you like that? Did you remember at, at nighttime when you looked like this? And uh, the baby was boom, 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 moving all over the place, right? Wasn't that a great feeling? Yeah. Uh, you know, I've never been pregnant, never will, so you can, you're the only ones that can tell. tell that when, when, this little person is, when this little person is moving inside you, amen? Did it feel good that just, oh, honey, touch. He just moved. Oh, there he goes. And he's moving. He's going to be a football player. And she's, she's born a tomcat. Way to go, all right? So now, now look, rejoice, O barren one that does not bear. Now, who are the barren ones? The barren ones who just practiced the faith but had no fruit. So what are we going to learn about in Galatians 5? You need the fruit of the what? Spirit. Spirit. How many know there's a lot of people upstairs that are absolutely barren? Now, what's a barren person? Go to Mass. Get it over with. That's what they're convinced of upstairs. Get it over with. Guess how barren they are. They are so barren they will never have any kids, spiritually speaking. Amen? Then he says, break forth and shout. Now, underline the word break forth. The breaking forth, we get the word nazir. How many ever heard of Nazareth? Break forth. So what's this whole sign? This is a whole sign. If you circle that, that's Messiah. When there's a breaking forth, you see who God is. Okay? Next, he goes on to say there, who art not in travail. Because now this is the end of what Messiah has done. This is, this is the glory that is yours. For the death, death desolate have more children. So what did Abraham have to do? Wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait. Sarah, 89, gets pregnant. Wow! And guess what happened? Yitzhak is born because she was laughing when she found out in Genesis chapter 18. She had a cow fit. I'm, I'm 89. I'm going to have a baby. A piccolo, bambino, piccolo, 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 piccolo. And she's hysterical, right? Now she's, she's free because he's going to be in the line. She, she was always, what, barren. And so now at 90, she has a piccolo, 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 bambino. And so she rejoices. And what happened to Elisheva, Elizabeth? She starts to laugh. And John, what does John do? Bloop, bloop. You know what John did? He went nuts inside of her. Exercise, exercise. That little kid was going bang, 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 bang. When, when Jesus was in the midst, he was going boom, 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 boom. And just, Elizabeth's going like this. <laughs> So when Blessed Mother walks in with Jesus, you know, she, Jesus is inside. I mean, can you imagine? I, ha I have a vision in my mind. Here's Blessed Mother with Jesus inside her. Do you think they touched? Ladies, remember when you walked like that? Remember when you sat down on the couch and tried to get up? You know, the older I get, I count to three. <laughs> but I bet Elizabeth had to go one, two. I mean, she was. And guess what? Can you just see that encounter? Here's Mary, 14 year old virgin. Here's Elizabeth collecting Social Security checks. And they're meeting like this. Rejoice, you are barren. And then it says there, but this is, isn't this good stuff? For thou art in travail. If you look at Isaiah 66, Isaiah 66, go with me. Hopefully, I can get this done. If not, that's all right. Isn't this good stuff? Isn't the Bible rich? Now you know why I need more than five minutes on Sunday. Amen? Go to Isaiah 66. If we go down to verse 9, 
10. 10. Isaiah 66. Now this is this is called the apocalypse of Isaiah. This is the end times of Isaiah. Everyone with me in Isaiah 66? Codena verse 9 and, 9 and 10. Shall I bring to the birth and not to cause to bring forth? Who is birthed here? Ishmael. Was that God's plan to have an Ishmael? No. It was a who? It was an Isaac. It represents all of, all of religion. It represents them not following God and Ishmael and, uh, from Arabia there. Now, look, look go, go with me. Um, uh, oh, underline verse 7. Underline verse 7. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Underline that. See verse 7? Everybody should have that start in your Bible. Okay? Everybody see that? Isaiah 66, verse number 7. Every underline that should be start. And that's, that's what the church believes happened to Mary. Okay? Just so you know. Before her pain came upon her, she, she delivered a son. Does that sound beautiful or what? So everybody box that in there. That's what the church understands with Mary. That Mary didn't have any pains when she bore Jesus. Okay? Now you see different interpretations. Next, who has heard of such a thing? I mean, before the pains even came, boop! For, for those who have faith in Jesus Christ, what happens to all your pains? They become meaningful. Do you have the pain that you used to have? No. There should be in each, uh, each of us, even though there are pains in our life called body pains and anguishes and emotions and all that stuff we still all carry with us. Amen. But now we know how to bear it better. Amen? And they have a purpose. They has a purpose. Who has heard of such a thing? Underline verse 8. Who has seen such things? Shall a lamb be born in one day? So, isn't this very powerful what Paul is saying? When you're born again, it's like having a brand new lamb right in front of you one day. Is that impossible? How many know when you blink your eye and you go to heaven one day, how many know you're going to say, this isn't Middletown? <laughs> wow. Wow. How many know you're going to do, how many, how, how quick will that, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, in the twinkling of an eye, underline the next line there. Shall a lamb be born in one day? Now, why do you think Isaiah is asking us these impossible questions? Why do you think, because, it's like, I mean, you're really saying crazy things. Shall a lamb be born in one day? So outstanding is this, that when this salvation comes in Christ, it's like, it's, it's so beyond what you could imagine. How many know you're all saved in Christ, aren't you? Yes. Henry, are you? Yes. All right, when you're saved in Christ, your salvation is so incredible. Did you know when Jesus heals people, the Greek word is sozo, S-O-Z-O, S-O-Z-O. The, the healing that you read about when, he, when Jesus heals like the woman who touched him, it never means just a healing physically. When the Bible says Jesus healed that woman, it's the total person. How many know the reason why people go to church, communion, and everything else, and they're not changed? Because their total person has not been affected by just one on in there. Do you know when a lot of people go to church, they're worse when they leave? And I've been there. Hi. Shall a nation be brought forth in one moment? But as soon as Zion was in labor, underline, who's Zion? Zion means in Hebrew, the tower. What's Zion? It's the very mountain that Jesus celebrated the Eucharist, celebrated the resurrection, and Pentecost. Shall, shall Zion be in labor? She brought forth her son. Shall I bring, bring to birth and not cause to bring forth, says the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth, shut the womb? Then he says, look at verse 10. Are, are you getting this? He says, rejoice with Yerushalayim and be glad for all, all who, use, who love her. Rejoice with her. Redeem people rejoice. All who mourn over her. What is Paul doing? Remember, he's just a... He's saying, until I see you, what am I doing over this church of ours? I am crying every day. You know what my you heard me say, it, well, they don't get it. And so I pace back and forth. Mm -hmm. Lord, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to communicate? My English is limited. So the new trend of the kids today is like, what? What? I said, I know, I just learned English yesterday. You can't understand me. What? 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 One day I was preaching to senior citizens in a nursing home. I, I spoke really loud. How many of you are a senior citizen? How many of you speak louder? 
And one lady said, oh, I can hear this one. <laughs> <laughs> then he says there, rejoice with Yerushalayim, rejoice with her, all you who are mourned, but you may suck and satisfy at her consoling breast. And, and by the way, that's the word for El Shaddai. How many of you have heard El Shaddai? I like the Pentecostal saying, El Shaddai! So El Shaddai, and by the way, what does this mean if you box that in there? It goes all the way back to Genesis 15, the first time God appeared to Abram. El Shaddai. And the literal meaning... The God who is more than enough. The, the God who is more than enough. Yes, those are the looser translations. But it literally means God of the breast. Look at Genesis 15, 1. When, when, when Abraham hears a word from God, it's El Shaddai, God of the breast. Are you getting this? So what does Isaiah say? This is the consolation. Now, what, if, what does everybody here need? You and I need the milk of our conversion. Now, remember I told you this. Does everybody know this? How many? Remember, I think I told you. Review. We're about done. I, I'm not going to finish. But isn't this good stuff? Yes. The word amen. I told you this many times. Everybody say amen you. Amen. Now, correctly, you're supposed to respond, Amen. So, what you're saying, if you want to go to strict Hebrew, you're saying, every time you say, Amen, you're saying, I am receiving from my mother's milk. Did you know you're saying that? Yes. Pay attention when you go to church, alright? Look alive. Because I think I'm doing funeral masses a lot when I look at you sometimes. Amen, look alive. And so, that is Amen you. The mother's milk. Wow, yes. Isn't this the, the angel coming to Mary right here in Isaiah? Isn't yes. this the incarnation? Yes, yes. Uh, we're just about done. I just want to, I, I, I took a long sidebar. That you may suck and be satisfied with her consoling breast, that you may drink deeply with delight from the abundance of her glory. Ladies, did you have a good time? Did you have an unbelievable, when you encountered your son or daughter laying right here? Do you know that that is the closest you will ever be to your kids when they were right here? That's true. That's true. Now, fast forward and I end to give you another great thought. That is called the bosom of Abraham. Fast forward to give you your last image. Jesus at the Last Supper. What was John doing? In his bosom. In his bosom. Remember John? And guess what God wants to do to everyone here? When I bless your body and you're dead, not you, Henry, you're still alive. <laughs> when I bless your body and you're dead, what am I doing? I'm saying, go to the bosom of God. Lean on God. Stay tuned next week. Good stuff. Does everybody know Jesus, your Lord and Savior? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. I want you in glory. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Lord, just bless your word to us. Lord, get my precious brothers and sisters excited about you and your truth and your gospel. Bless us, Lord, and thank you for the word, the meat of the scripture tonight. In Jesus' name, we receive from thy bounty. Amen. 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 Don't forget, the 22nd of this month, we have Healing Your Family Truth. That means if you have an interesting family, you better come so I can pray for them, okay? We're going to be spending some hours telling you how to get your kids back to God.